excited about the music uh, here in Seven Lakes with uh, presentation. So um, if you are here representing um, your church, just raise your hand. Aberdeen First Baptist. Here. You got one. Um, Ashley Heights. Here. Hold your hands up for me. Oh my goodness, that's past ten. I can't count that one. Uh, <laughs> All right, Bethlehem, uh, Beulah Hill, Calvary, Cameron, thank you, uh, Carthage, First Baptist, Cornerstone, Creekside Community, Eagle Spring, y'all here supporting this fellow, aren't you? <laughs> uh, Emmanuel, Ephesus, okay, Fairview, Faith. 
Flint Hill. Harmony. Ives Memorial. Lemon Springs. Middle Cross. Thank you, David. New Home. Open Arms. Okay. Uh, Pine Grove. Pinehurst, First Baptist. Piney Woods. Pleasant Hill. Got you. Red Branch. Robbins, Southern Pines, okay. Taylor Memorial, thank you. Um, Vast First Baptist, uh, Victory Community, and West End First Baptist, okay. Thank you very much. As the next uh, speaker works his way up, Chris Allen, I wanted to recognize we have two of our previous associational ministers, leaders here. We've got uh, Brother Tom Lampkin, who was the previous, and then Brother Billy Graham. And we're grateful for both of your service and your presence here tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, So from the Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, we have uh, Chris Allen, and he's going to speak on denominational relations. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is good to, to see some familiar faces here. And where's David Reynolds? There's David Middle Cross. It's good to be here. I represent Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in the College of Southeastern. We're coming up on our 70th anniversary this year. It's amazing we've been uh, a seminary that long. I want to share with you a gift that we have for you. It's for each individual church, but we are celebrating 70 years, but in many ways we're just celebrating just a little over 25 years. Don't know if you know the history of our school. I came there when I was a little boy at six years old in 1967, and what I know now I would say, oh. A few years later I'd say, oh my. But today, I say, oh my goodness, because of where Southeastern stands. What I mean by that is Dr. Aiken, our president, is celebrating 18 years as president. Eight years ago, when on his 10th anniversary, he said, with the cooperative program, we've got to give back to the local church. We've got to give them a gift. What kind of gift could we possibly give to the local church? When I say, oh my goodness, of where we stand today, Danny Aiken has brought us back to the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And in this post-COVID world, where we stand as the Southern Baptist Convention, where we stand as one of your Southern Baptist seminaries, in this post-COVID world, the unity that puts us together is the cross. The unity that puts us together is the gospel. So our gift to you, and it's eight years old, and as I met these guys, uh, they both got their doctorate from Southeastern. They weren't aware uh, that we had this gift. So this is what I do in denominational relations, is try to get to many as associational meetings and state conventions that I can. What the gift is, I don't know if you realize, we've got 11 classes, nine in our language, in English, two in Spanish. But we've got some classes that are master's level classes. So don't, don't get too excited. I'm not asking you to enroll. This is a free gift to you. What you get is the opportunity to take Christ and the culture as one of our classes. Uh, expository, how do we exegete the scriptures? Um, one of the other ones that is my favorite is work and worship. How do we teach our church folks and our folks and our families to celebrate work and worship where Monday through Saturday... Christ is the center of all that we do. It's the same classes that I took in my master's level, but for you, because it's free, you don't have to do a paper, you don't have to order the textbooks. Uh, anything that's free, you get out whatever you want to put into it. 
So again, it's 11 free classes over in the fellowship hall. I've got a, a, a booth set up. So if you'll just come by and pick up a brochure. But I also want to tell you thank you because of the cooperative program is the only way that we have existed and continue to exist. I don't know if you knew our enrollment. 11 years ago, we had 3,700 students. Post-COVID, we haven't gone down. We thought, boy, if we could ever cross the threshold of 5,000 students. Dr. Aiken addressed our Board of Trustees last week. We have 5,700 students at Southeastern. And you know what I say, oh my goodness, with that is that when you center on the infallible and errant Word of God, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, that's what we're training our students. So with these nine free classes in English and two in Spanish, you download them and you take it at your own pace. And that's the beauty of it. It may take you five years. My favorite is when distance learning called me about five years ago. And they said, Chris, we, we've got a problem in a rural association uh, that it seems like they're not getting through the lectures. The lectures are 90 minutes and they're stopping at seven minutes. So the director asked me, he said, could you make a few phone calls? I said, I'll be happy to. So I called the association. They gave me the pastor's name. I called the pastors. They all turned me over to their men's director of men's ministry. They called me back. They said, Mr. Chris, you've got to understand, we fry an egg on the fourth Saturday of the month or once a month. And our senior adults, I call you mature adults instead of senior adults, they're watching these videos but it's like drinking out of a fire hydrant. So they're pushing pause seven minutes into it, and that's all they can handle. You know what? If over those seven minutes, if the topic with the text of Scripture, all we can say is, my sister says, go God. Right, David? So stop by the table. I'll be back there if we can help you in any way. But given to the cooperative program, please understand every dollar that goes into every offering plate in the Southern Baptist Convention, 50% comes off the tuition. We get seven cents, about eight cents, 7.8 cents on every dollar out of the six seminaries, but that comes down to tuition reduction of 50%. So your students can go to our college or a seminary for less than $10,000 a year, whereas if it weren't for your faithful giving, it would be over 20,000. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Brother Chris. Next, we're going to have uh, Dr. Matt Brogel come up. And, you know, Brother Tom, it must be make you feel really good that when you retired, we had to hire two people to do your job. So um, we're grateful. <laughs> we're grateful for um, uh, Brother Virgil and, and Matt for the work that they're doing for our association. So I'll turn it over to you, Brother Matt. I've heard that joke about you, Brother Tom, four times, and it gets truer and truer every time I hear it. So <laughs> to have J. Billy Graham here today and to have Tom and have conversations with both of them within the last two months, uh, it's encouraging to know how much work they put in, how much they have done to support this association, and to be here with you guys today is a joy. And I get a great privilege right now. We were at the associational training um, uh, just a, this past week. And one of the great blessings of that is they gave us some awards, not for our work, but for yours. And we want to recognize um, three churches were given awards. We want to recognize you guys and say thank you for your service. Um, can I have a representative from First Baptist Church, Vass, um, come up for a uh, recognition for leading the Sand Hills Baptist Association in total giving to the 2020 North Carolina Missions Offering? Well, do we have a representative from uh, First Baptist Church Pinehurst here tonight? That's okay. We know where you live. <laughs> and how about somebody from Lemon Springs Baptist Church? Do we have somebody here from Lemon Springs Baptist? We know where you live, too. Thank you guys so much to giving to the missions offering. It's a big deal, and I really appreciate you being willing to give of your time and your money. Missions is at the heart of being a Southern Baptist, so thank you. We'll call uh, 
one of our very active executive council members up next, uh, Mr. Tommy Blue, uh, to talk about the um, uh, Seven Lakes Baptist Church membership. Tommy. Good evening. The Sandhills Baptist Association Executive Council makes a motion to approve membership for Seven Lakes Baptist Church with watch care for 12 months without reservation. This motion comes from a standing uh, committee and does not require a second. At this time, Brother Chris, I would like to introduce Brother Chris Roboski, pastor, and I'm going to let you kind of share a little bit about your church. Well, good evening. Well, Virgil gave, called me the other night and he said, okay, you're going to speak at the meeting. And he said, I'm giving you five minutes. I said, you haven't ever heard me preach, have you? <laughs> <laughs> See if I can keep on time. Um, I'll just, I'm just going to kind of share how I got to become a Southern Baptist. I didn't, I wasn't raised a Southern Baptist. I was, um, I was raised in an independent fundamental Baptist church. And, uh, and I went to school at Liberty University. And what I saw though, was I saw that the independent Baptist church was moving toward isolationism, where the Southern Baptist church was moving toward evangelism. And I knew I don't want to be part of isolation. I want to be part of evangelism. We're called to reach this world. And so I, I was really convicted about that I want to be part, the people that I was listening and reading to were all seemed to be Southern Baptist. And so I started to research it and, um, and also missions. Um, one of the great things that we've seen is um, I pastored another church in Virginia. And when I was there, I saw a lot of mission stuff that was really, really poorly run. And it really turned me off. And I started thinking, if God calls m one of my children into ministry and to be a missionary, I want to make sure that it's covered, that it's not just a run by the mill, run of the mill operation. I want to make sure that it's right. And so I started digging into what the Southern Baptists believe and, and how they do missions. And, uh, and I, we came on board with that. So uh, 10 or 11 years ago, um, we, we, I came to pastor Seven Lakes Baptist Church. And one of the first things we did was we joined the Southern Baptist Convention, um, started giving. We, our, we have a missions opportunity. Our, our goal is to give 15% of all the money that come into our church goes to missions. We have 5% goes to local missions. 5% goes to domestic missions, and 5% goes to the, um, to the international missions. We believe that that's, how, that's what Jesus taught when he taught that we're to go into our Jerusalem, our Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And I think that it's, uh, it's an honest way to do it, that, we, that, just, that our church knows that every penny of every penny that comes into our church, 15% is going to missions. Um, one of the other things that really... Um, what God's doing at Seven Lakes Baptist right now is I've been really convicted about discipleship. Um, I've grown up, I have seen discipleship happen, but it's very, it's not very organized. And so what we decided was that we want to make sure, because what I see is people get saved, they get baptized, they um, come, they're part of the fellowship, they start serving, but that's it. But the, but the Great Commission is that we um, baptize them, we get them involved in the church, but then they go back out. And so our, our uh, purpose statement is to connect, to grow, to serve, and to go. So we connect with them by salvation and baptism. Uh, we get them discipled in the word. We get them growing and understanding what we believe and why we believe it. And then we get them serving. They serve in different ministries of the church. But it doesn't stop there. Unless they're evangelizing the lost and starting that process over again, they're not discipled, and so we just feel like it's really important that we do that. So the last, uh, last two years, last year, we started with, um, we just went through the doctrines of the church. I took a year and just taught through the doctrines of the church so our church knew what they believed. We had a lot of people recently come to Christ, and we wanted to make sure that they were grounded in the word. And then this year, um, we're doing discipleship, and so I just wanted to read five rules that, um, that Jesus gave us for discipleship. Hopefully, it'll challenge you tonight. The rules for discipleship that Jesus gave in Matthew 22, 37, his command was to love God more than anyone else. That's a, a command for us disciples. Number two, we're called to, in Matthew 16, 24, we're called to deny ourselves and take up our cross. And number three, the third rule found in Luke 14, 33, 
It says, forsake everything that you have. And then in Luke 14, uh, 25 to 34, he tells us that we're to count the cost. And, uh, and I just want to challenge you. The, the fifth one is to follow Christ. And if we're going to be disciples of Christ, we need to get serious about the gospel, serious about getting it out and reaching the lost for him. But that's what's going on. We're doing that through our small groups. We have discipleship in our small groups. We also have uh, about, about 60 men that are going through. Uh, we, it's called Every Man a Warrior. And they're meeting at 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they're meeting all times during the week. But it is intense discipleship. It is scripture memory. It's making sure that they know how to do a quiet time, that they're having quiet time, and there's accountability to it. Um, so that we're going through basic discipleship. There's three books that takes you a year to go through the books, but we've been using that to disciple our men. And I believe that the men ought to be the leaders of the church. They ought to be the ones that are leading the pack, leading their family. So we started there, but then we also started the women. Um, say it loud. Cultivating holy beauty. It's basically the same thing for women. It's not basically the same thing. It's completely different because this is geared toward women. <laughs> but it's a program that takes about a year to go through. But, um, but that's, in a nutshell, who we are and where we're going. So. Thank you, Brother Chris. You've heard the recommendation from the council. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Jerry, Vice Moderator. Thank you. Tommy. And, uh, May I speak a word of affirmation here? Um, if you would, please just come to the microphone. Uh, we're going to open it up for discussion now, and I will uh, recognize you for that, for that word. And, but if you do have something to say, please come to the microphone. I would like to heartily endorse the motion that has been made. Uh, Pastor Ken Hankins, that was the founding pastor at Seven Lakes Baptist Church, was a good friend of mine. I first met him about 1984. I was pastor at Eagle Springs Baptist Church then, and Brother Ken came to be the pastor at Big Oak Christian Church and involved in the Big Oak Christian Academy. Two of our precious members at Eagle Springs Baptist Church, Mike Martin and his precious wife Gay and their children, Jeremy, Matthew, and Bobby Sue. She was born about the second year I was there. Had the darkest, prettiest blue eyes. I mean brown eyes. Brown. They were part of the founding <laughs> nucleus of your church and uh, they are precious to us and I it's an answer prayer for y'all to be here. Uh, I would like to say the, the watch care is, uh, that's not a probation. That's that we watch over you and care for you during, the, during the, as you get to know, we're not an association. 32 congregations are an association and that's five or 6,000 people that in, in all these churches. And uh, that's a lot for y'all to take in and uh, if I can be of help to y'all during, during any of this time, uh, I don't know as much as I used to, but uh, <laughs> what I do know, I'm, I'm more sure of. So uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you so much, brother. You kind of caught me off guard there. I was going to pick on um, uh, Pastor Roboski because he had forgotten the name of that one program, and I said, man, all it takes is that much distance for it to catch on. <laughs> Come on up, Brother David, to the microphone. <laughs> Chris and I um, have been friends now for a long time, for a pretty good while, not a long time, but uh, our churches are very close together. Um, we have participated in some services together, and um, I love uh, Chris. I, I think he's a, a godly Christian man and wants to do the Lord's will. And I give a great word of affirmation to for them to be a part of our association. Glad that that's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or points of discussion? If there are none, then we will vote by a raise of the hand. So if you're in favor of Seven Lakes Baptist Church becoming a member of our association, would you please raise your hand and hold it up?
I'm not going to try to count that, brother. <laughs> it's unanimous. Uh, but I will ask, if you are not in favor of uh, Seven Lakes Baptist Church joining our association, you may raise your hand now. None. So, welcome. We're so happy to have you. <clears throat> Um, that was supposed to be messengers only, right? Do I need to go back and do that again? No. All right. I told you, don't take long. Um, <clears throat> next, um, we will have um, uh, Dr. Matt Brogel again uh, to talk about the uh, Sand Hills Baptist Association semi-annual highlights. Y'all are about tired of seeing me walk up those steps, aren't you? Guys, I just wanted to highlight some things. We always wanted the spring meeting, uh, as Virgil and I started in, intentionally trying to work on what would be the association going forward. The thing that we wanted to do at the spring meeting was just make it a time of rejoicing. Um, there's, there's enough hardship. The, the fall meeting is when we vote on the budget, right? It's when we vote on the budget and hear highlights of what the association is doing. But we want the spring meeting to be a time of rejoicing, and I believe it should be, and it is. There's some good things happening. We want to make sure you know about it. Back at the fall meeting, we voted on a brand new vision statement, which was to encourage the minister to equip the churches and to evangelize the lost. That that's what our association would be about. I wanted to highlight some things that have happened along all three of those areas. First was we've continued doing monthly pastors' luncheons. We've invited pastors in our association to come together once a month at a variety of different churches. And we're intentionally holding them at churches, different churches, so you can see other churches meet other pastors, and so that you can kind of spread the wealth. It, it, you know, coming out here to the north side of the county might have been a trek for you today. It's 30 minutes from where I live, right? So we have a, at different places so you can drive all over and make it convenient for everybody, give everybody a chance to travel and pray. So we've been doing those and having trainings. We've had the president of the North Carolina Baptist State Convention come in and speak at one of those. There's been trainings, opportunities for us to learn, grow, learn from each other, and pray for each other. It's been a time of great blessing to me. And I think to the other pastors as well. Um, we've also had, uh, at Christmas, we had the wonderful opportunity with leftover resources, unused resources from last year's budget, to provide gift cards to every pastor in our association at Christmas time. Every pastor got a Visa gift card and a personal note telling them we love them, we're praying for them. And that's right to do. And so I hope that was a blessing to those wonderful men because we know 2020 was a challenging year. And if they used it for presents, great. If they used it for bills, great. But however they used it, we're thankful for them. Um, in addition to that, and, and a part of our process of trying to encourage the ministers is we've been counseling pastors, reaching out to people that are struggling or hurting and trying to engage them and love them. And so if, you, if your pastor is struggling, we encourage you, tell them to call Virgil or I. We would love to pray with them, talk with them, walk them through, and even get them other resources that are available to them. Because, look, no one in an association should have to suffer alone. There is help. There is hope. His name is Jesus, and he's got great resources in the Southern Baptist Convention for you. And we want to give them to you, and including us. We want to be a resource to you. So please do that. As far as equipping, um, we did start up equip through the Equip Network at Southeastern teaching classes. So you can do your seminary training if you're an up-and-coming pastor or just wanting to learn more, you can take classes here that give you credit through Southeastern, and Virgil and I would be your teachers. And if you have a doctoral degree, you can work with Southeastern and become an Equip Network professor as well to teach in your church. And the great thing about that is it lets people learn, pastors learn, in a real church setting, not in the classroom setting. They're still getting 100% quality teaching and training, but on the local church level. And so we've started teaching classes already. Um, I'm already working through some teaching somebody right now this semester, and God's already lined up for three more this summer. And so we give God glory for that. That's one of the ways we can equip the church is to help our pastors be better trained, better educated. Um, we had one pastor ordination council, and we have one pending. Um, we've helped with pastoral search committees. We've been assisting them in finding the right pastors. Um, and by right pastors, we don't mean who we want. We mean who, what we believe God would have them to be. 
Help them to find the right resources. Help them to find the right list of people to look through. And just praying for them and trying to help them figure out what do they want for the vision for their church. We've offered revitalization training to equip the churches. And we have pastoral cohorts. We've been trying to work on location-specific cohorts for churches to try to get the pastors together in their area so they can form a strategy to equip and reach their own communities together, not in competition, but in collaboration. And so the pastors within a five-mile radius are going to be getting together. We're still rolling that out. Two of the cohorts are already meeting of the eight. You'll hear more and more about that. But guys, I'm excited about the opportunity that that provides for our churches to work together to reach the lost. They say 70% of the church, people in Moore County don't go to church anywhere. We want to change that. I'd love at the fall meeting for us to talk about the churches we're going to have to plant because we're reaching people. Not, not just talking about what we're doing to revitalize, but what we're doing to plant more. But God is so good, and he's doing good things. And as far as evangelizing, there's a Filipino church planting opportunity that has already started, that we've already been in contact with, trying to help them and invite them in to be a part of our association that's been sponsored by the North Carolina Baptist State Convention. In addition to that, um, we have ongoing conversations with two ethnic church planters supported by our association. Um, Virgil had the wonderful opportunity to travel to Atlanta, um, paid for by the North American Mission Board for a revitalize and replanting conference for training really to help our churches stay strong and become stronger. Um, just to give us an opportunity, we want to help you guys be as healthy as possible. And we're so excited that we're better together. And some churches are on the decline. <laughs> But we don't think it has to stay that way. We, we want to see you come back up to God's glory and be a story that we celebrate right here, right? And so Virgil went to a wonderful training to give opportunities for us to be able to better help you. Um, nine churches responded to our desire, our, our reach out for the missional alignment profile that we we're creating. We still like you. If your church is doing mission somewhere, let us know. We want to get a map together. We talked about this, at the, well, Virgil talked about this. I was at home watching the live stream commenting like crazy because I couldn't be here on the edge of my seat. We want us to work together for missions, not against each other. If you're working in Kenya and somebody from my church, the Holy Spirit tugs them and says, we want them to go to Kenya. We want them to go to Kenya with your church. It doesn't matter that my church isn't going on the mission trip. What matters is that God's kingdom and his spirit is at work and we're working together. We're always better together. So we're working on that. If you haven't sent me your alignment, your mission alignment profile, if you haven't told me where your church is doing missions around the world, including here in North Carolina, let me know. Please send me an email. Give me a phone call. I'll meet you for lunch and we can work, it, work through it. And lastly, but not least, Blasting Cast happened in 2020 and saw its highest attendance, am I right, Brother, Brother Jerry, highest attendance in, in most salvations this past year? Yes. Yes. God, that's a blessing. That is a ministry taking part in your back door. This is something right here local that we can be a part of. And so I'm so thankful for the partnership that we have and the, and the great things that Blasting Cast is doing and the great things that we're able to do to uh, encourage, equip, and evangelize. Now, we do not currently have a mechanism for you to communicate your concerns, ideas, and your questions. We want that to change. And you're going to hear from Virgil in just a minute about how that can change. Because we want to hear more from you because the same Holy Spirit that's in me is the same Holy Spirit in you. And that means you have the Holy Spirit talking to you about ways we can better reach more County in the Sandhills. And we want to hear from you. We believe God's got great work to do, and we're excited about what he's doing in you, through your churches, and in our association. Thank you so much for the time that you're investing even tonight to celebrate with us God's great work in the Sand Hills. Thank you, Brother Matt. <clears throat> our next uh, presenter is uh, Ms. Christy Talbert. Um, she is our uh, treasurer with the Sand Hills Baptist Association. I, I have known Christy for some time and I have seen her experience level at handling finances and, and uh, her education in that area and she is truly a blessing uh, to our association. Not only is she pretty, she knows how to manage money, okay? <laughs> I don't know if I can live up to that. Don't worry, it's gonna be brief. Just, we're not doing budget tonight. So, um, do we have slides? Here they come. Okay, so a visual presentation here 
um, of the percentages of our, our donating churches. Uh, so we have 32 churches in our organization and we have 15 uh, that are giving. So if you look at, if you just do a quick glance at the chart, all that green, those, those are the churches that are not giving right now. So we have 15 that are giving, that's in, your, in the orange, and one non-affiliated uh, church giving as well in the yellow. Next slide. Okay, so uh, receipts looking at the quarter, we have taken in $26,500. Uh, what we projecting to stay, you know, afloat, 33,105. So we ran a little bit short uh, in the quarter, $6,600, that's uh, shown in red. Okay, and then we uh, have a summary here of our financial position, looking at the amount that we have in checking right now, $25,900 uh, in, in our SBA reserve fund, we have $29,005. In our building and grounds endowment fund, 58,000, and the cemetery fund, 12,005. One more chart. So then ending on a good note, we wanted to show some, you know, some positive here too. The month of March uh, for 2021 as compared to the prior five years was the second highest uh, month that we had of giving. So that was very good given uh, for the month of March as compared just behind actually 20. I see a lot. I see a lot of your faces out there that we have been working with hard over the last eight to nine months, uh, and all the work you've been doing over the years. As I was just a little pup, right? I've been a part of this association for probably a, close to twelve years now, pastoring in this association for about six years, and now serving you as your AMS uh, for the past what three or four years now. Time flies when you're having fun, right? Yeah about eight months, so we're thankful for that. We're grateful for the opportunity. I wanna remind you um, of our charter of what Matt and I were charged to do as the association voted to have Matt and I take the lead to revitalize and go through a deliberate two-year process, rough give or take a few months, um, that we were specifically tasked with the purpose of coming up with and evaluating recommendations how to strengthen the association to make it effective, to look at new ways of doing ministry and to look at ways we can do things potentially better and to expand things that we've never thought about doing before in new opportunities to take the gospel to more County. One of the statements that we've been saying for a few months now is we want more for the kingdom together, more. We together want to see more together for the kingdom. And that's you and I working together, 32, now 33, we can finally say that, 33 churches. And we see that growing, friends. We see more churches catching the fire for what we are going to do to turn more county into a county that is not dragging behind where only 70% don't even go to church, don't open a Bible. They don't even know who their Savior is like, like you and I. We have an opportunity to flip down it on, on its head in the next few years. So I get the task of bringing to you some recommendations that have been brought to the executive council that we have been working through for probably eight or nine months together. Uh, we've been discussing things with a lot of entities. We have a few other folks here tonight that are going to assist with that. We've got Brother Robert Simons from the North Carolina Baptist Foundation. Robert, if you'd like to come up here just in case I need backup, you're here. But again, we want to share with you these are recommendations only. Tonight we are not voting on anything. Uh, we are going to explain to you the time for discussion and collaborative work uh, for us to work together to come up with these recommendations and fine tune them. But here's what I want us to do. I want us to tell ourselves it's okay to dream again. It's okay that we have a dream that is so big that we're kind of scared that we might fail. But here's what I know. If God is behind it, we won't fail. If the Holy Spirit is right in the middle of it, it can't fail because it's the work that God has called us to. Amen? And you know this. You've heard the rallying cry before. But here's where we're going to give some recommendations for you. And the first recommendation I want to share with you is number one. 
And I'm, 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 I phrase these in terms of goals and actions so you can specifically have the tangible. The goal, what we hope to achieve, and the action that it's going to take in order to do that. Okay? Again, these are recommendations. Goal number one, we have heard from some of you in the past few months about the challenge we have within our association being spread out all over Moore County is that we only meet twice a year. So how do the churches, how does your church, Middle Cross, how does your church, Southern Pines, how does your church, Taylor Memorial, how do you get a voice into what's going on in the association? How can you be heard at a meeting to where we can plan together with the executive council and move forward with hearing your voice from the association. That has been one of our greatest challenges so far. So we propose to institute a mechanism to allow executive council meetings to be open for all messengers and pastors to attend every time we meet. And what we hope to do by opening up those executive council meetings is to get and solicit your feedback to get your ideas, your comments, your ministry context of how the world is affecting how you do ministry. And we would like to add that to our decision-making process. Because again, we don't want to plan in a vacuum. We don't want to do anything in isolation or unilaterally without the Association of Churches getting an opportunity to speak. We know that has been a challenge in the past, so we hope today that you will hear that recommendation and that you will begin to attend our executive council meetings to provide input, feedback, recommendations, and give us new dreams that maybe we haven't even thought about. Your executive council is made up of 11 people, uh, myself and Brother Matt Brogel, and the nine members that represent some of our churches, but not all of our churches. And we would like to expand that, not officially making them part of the council, but officially giving you a platform to have your voices heard as a church. So that's the first recommendation that we would like to make and present that to you tonight. The second recommendation is something that we're all challenged with in a ministry context of dwindling resources. Brother Chris Allen at Southeastern has talked about the need for what they're doing through the cooperative program. Did you know that the North Carolina Baptist State Convention reduced its overall operating budget by just over $3 million this year? Why? Because giving has gone down. They've made staff cuts, they've made realignment decisions and other things because financially they are having to find new ways to do ministry. The ways they were doing them have changed. Uh, they're having to look at new ways to retool that. Same thing for us. Ms. Christie shared with you our financials. 15 out of 32. Now that's wonderful, folks, because in January and February it was 11 and 12. Now it's 15. One of those 15, or excuse me, 16, is Brother Chris Ramoski's church who's been giving since their church voted to join the association. In January, February, and March, their church has been financially contributing even though they haven't been a member. So now we can say 16 for the month of March churches have been giving. But we have seen an extreme decline in giving to associational work. If we look at participation tonight, we have many of our churches that are not here yet, that haven't come to the meeting. They're, why? Why is that? How can we help them with that? So one of the things we want to do, as the state resources are also getting smaller, we want to do something that allows us to take ownership of ministering to those in Moore County, and we have a financial institution or financial engine put in place to help us minister and to help our own churches financially, to help our own missionaries financially, to plant churches ourselves financially, to be able to support churches that are needing re revitalization financially. Churches that are risk closing their doors because they can't pay the electric bill or they need a new roof and the storm ripped it off and they don't have the funds to do that. What we recommend is to improve the financial resources for ministry impact within our association. The way we go about doing that is establishing an endowment fund in perpetuity to be used for missions, church strengthening, and pastoral and missionary education. And what I'd like to do for a minute is turn the floor over to Brother Robert Simons from the North Carolina Baptist Foundation, uh, who handles those type of activities. And I'm going to let Brother Robert talk to you about this endowment and what an endowment will do for us in perpetuity, and he can explain a few of those things to you. When uh, Virgil and Matt first contacted me um, about endowments, uh, I was pleased to tell them that, uh, and, and I think they knew this already, Sand Hills already had an endowment set up. As a matter of fact, they have two of them. And um, so they were very familiar with the concept, but uh, I've, I'm with the North Carolina Baptist Foundation. We're an agency of the Baptist State Convention. I'm the area manager for the uh, foundation. and so. 
part of my job is to help uh, North Carolina Baptist uh, establish funds for kingdom work uh, for, for now and for uh, the time until Jesus returns. And so um, what uh, uh, Virgil and Matt had asked me to do was to kind of come tonight, explain how an endowment works, what you might uh, could see come out of endowment. We actually have a couple of different options in regards to endowments. We have an endowment which is uh, traditionally a, uh, a, a permanent account uh, that's set in place where the uh, principal uh, would never be touched and then the uh, earnings from the endowment or that account uh, would be used in perpetuity uh, again until the Lord returns. Uh, we also have something called a modified endowment, which gives you the same opportunity to set up a, an amount of principal uh, to be invested and to use uh, the funds until a specified period of time. And then inside of that agreement, you can specify what would happen at the end of that time. Um, so uh, you've, you've got a couple of different options there. Endowments are kind of traditionally known um, in Southern Baptist work, but modified endowments are something that we've more recently uh, begun to do. Just to kind of give you an idea, um, the foundation has been doing endowments for 101 years now. We were founded in 1920 uh, as a result of gifts that were given to uh, the Baptist State Convention for the building of the uh, Baptist Hospital in Winston-Salem. Um, the hospital was built in 1923, and part of the concern was, okay, we, we can raise the money, but we want, we want to make sure we can keep it running. And so uh, people gave to endowments uh, that over uh, that period of time, almost 100 years that the hospital's been in existence, had been there to help support the work of the hospital. Uh, things like uh, today, you see the Mother's Day offering gets added to that endowment to um, to continue that work of the Mother's Day offering. Um, but so the foundation has been doing this work for, for over 100 years. Uh, we actually have, I think it's 575 different ministries, a lot of which are churches that have set up endowments. We manage about $175 million in assets that every year we pay uh, probably in the range of seven and a half to nine and a half million dollars per year to these ministries to be able to do, uh, continue the Lord's work, whether it be in the churches or the different uh, institutions of Baptist life. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, the returns on a typical endowment uh, per year is about five and a half percent historically over a hundred years. Um, you, can, you can roughly say that our returns have been about five and a half percent on an endowment. So what that means is for every $100,000 inside of an endowment, you can expect that uh, you would have about $5,500 that would be available to do ministry. So you can kind of use that number to multiply uh, what it would take to have uh, to a fund that could uh, supply funds for ministry as, as, uh, as uh, Virgil has, has mentioned. Um, I had uh, run some different illustrations for Virgil that I think he's going to use at some point in the, the future um, to kind of give you an idea of what does that mean in terms of ministry over time. Um, and I'm not sure you want me to get into those details tonight, but uh, I, I did share with, with Virgil that um, we have a number of um, uh, folks that we've worked with, with through the years who have done things very similar to what you're talking about. As I said, uh, we manage about $175 million worth of assets in endowment types of accounts uh, today, uh, helping 575 different ministries. Um, but we're starting to see a trend uh, of, of churches uh, in particular that may be struggling that set up endowments uh, to further ministries that, that they can continue to do uh, ministry even when the church shrinks and um, maybe doesn't have uh, the ability to continue to operate. Um, Andrew Avenue Baptist Church in Durham is an example 
uh, they came to me um, about five or six years ago and uh, their membership had dwindled down, dwindled down to about um, uh, 25 folks and uh, they were concerned that uh, they weren't growing and that they wanted to be able to continue doing ministry in the, in the name of Andrew Avenue Baptist Church even though the church appeared that it may not continue to exist as it was. Uh, they were able to sell their, their building uh, and they uh, received proceeds from that that they put into an endowment and they're supporting five different ministries in Durham uh, at a substantial amount of money per ministry in the city of Durham uh, that will last until the Lord returns. Um, so it's exciting that they're able to do ministry in the name of Andrew Avenue Baptist Church and will be able to in perpetuity until Jesus returns. Um, that's just one example. We've actually had an association, uh, Yates Baptist Association, that's, uh, they, they had a, a really nice office building that they had out, uh, that they um, didn't need all of anymore. It was, a, it was a very big, nice building, and they just didn't need the whole uh, building anymore. They were offered a church uh, that had disbanded they decided to sell their building, and they, um, they moved into this disbanded church. They were able to sell their building for a million dollars. They put that money into partially into helping upfit the church they were moving into so that it would be usable. Um, they took the rest of it and uh, put it into an endowment that they're able to do ministry from they actually have five different congregations that are now meeting in that church uh, that they moved into. Their offices are there, but they have a sanctuary. They have five different um, uh, congregations that meet. They share space on Sundays. Um, it's just it's a phenomenal area of worship now because you've got an English-speaking group, an Hispanic group, and three other uh, multicultural <coughs> groups that are meeting in, in this church. Um, where the association also resides and they're able to do all that ministry because of the funds that were raised from the uh, selling of that building. So uh, we, we have many, many examples in the foundation we uh, could help you with um, and uh, we uh, look forward to a partnership with you in the future. So that is recommendation two and how an endowment fund will help us. Uh, for those of you that care to contribute to that down the road when that decision is, is come to a head where we reach that decision. Now the third one has to do with the financial uh, repurposing, if you will, improving our financial stewardship and ministry impact. And this comes by a recommendation of the sale of the associational property to establish the ministry endowment. Now, when we talk about selling the associational property, for about eight now, months now, we've been working through what does that look like? How does that shape the future for the association? Why would we even think about doing that? We wouldn't possibly want to take a step back. We've had people give sweat and blood and money and sacrifice to build this building for our association to exist because that building is our association. Well, we understand that completely. But remember, our charter was to relook what does the ministry in the future look like? And as I work with other association mission strategists around the state convention, as I talk to folks from Texas to Georgia to Florida within our own state leadership, uh, Lester Evans, Lynn Sasser, uh, those that are doing associational ministry for many years, they also are understanding that the landscape for how associations do ministry is changing. We are very much so a connected community today. I do discipleship training in Honduras and Africa and Vietnam with my smartphone in the mornings during the week. I can talk to pastors via Zoom, Skype, and yes, none of those things are substitutes for in-person meeting. And we're not saying they're gonna be. We still meet in person, because all you pastors like to eat, and that means I gotta take you to a restaurant, right? So most of our meetings are happening at dinner, over lunch. Guess what, we're breaking bread together and fellowshipping. I'm spending time and Matt is spending time coming to where you are and meeting you where ministry is happening in your context, in your culture, in your community. We're coming to you and we're bringing all of those resources in the trunk of our car via our laptop, computer, our cell phone, our smartphones, and the ability to bring you together. For about 16 months, maybe 18 months now, we've been hosting pastor lunch-ins. 
We have yet to have to use the associational building one time to have the fellowship. Last month we had 20 folks attend, 20 pastors and ministry leaders attend our pastor's luncheon at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church with Brother Greg Newton. Opened up his facility, we shared that space. Uh, Brother Michael came down from the state convention uh, and shared with us what's going on in leadership life. So we're using the facilities and the churches that God already has given us to do ministry. When we look at the assessment of the overall associational building and property, we've already uh, used quite a bit of our funding and resources to keep that building maintained. Um, what, one of the things we looked at doing, how do we maintain the facility? One of the challenges right now is who's cutting the grass? How do we maintain the shrubbery? How do we keep the building painted on the outside? Who is keeping up with all of these challenges? So we looked at how do we, how do we fund that as well? What's that going to cost us? Right now, just the landscaping maintenance alone is going to run between six dollars and $8,000 based on the bids that we receive to take care of the exterior of the property. Um, and right now, our phone has not been ringing off the hook to help us cut the grass at the associational building. But we have that taken care of. We've gotten someone that's going to take care of that property for us, and I'll share that a little bit with you later. So what do we do? Let me share with you a few ministry decision points that have gone into this recommendation. Again, the Executive Council has worked for about eight months looking at the data, chewing on the resources, looking at the financials, looking at what does the future look like, talking with men like Robert Simons and the Baptist Foundation, and then Yates Association. I have lunch with that brother several times this week to talk about how he's reshaping ministry, and I won't share what they're doing, but they're going even further than what they've done. Uh, he's got some plans. That's fixing to be given. Well, I can't say. Never mind. But there's great things that they're doing, relooking associational ministry. So here's some ministry decision points that the executive council has worked through uh, tirelessly to, to discuss this. Number one, ministry has changed. New methods, ways, and means to do ministry require us to reshape and as we view the association and how we as an association do ministry. Culture has changed. Although we know the Bible transcends culture, time, and space, however, our associational building does not. Uh, it, there's changes coming with that. Ministry contexts have changed, how we minister, how we conduct ministry, and how churches as an association do ministry has changed. We're mobile, we are connected, and we are global at a fingertip. We want to leverage that even further to help churches take the gospel to more county and beyond. Thirdly, communication has changed, but resourcing has changed. How we are equipped, how we resource our churches to meet their mission field requirements have changed. As state level and SPC budgets continue to go down, we want to provide a, a mechanism of financial resources right here at our fingertips. I've listened to several pastors and church members share with me their concerns about the SBC becoming too powerful. Now, whether that's true or not, it's a concern that's been expressed to us. I've heard concerns about the state convention wants to take over associations and do all the ministry. I hear the concerns. I can't say it's true or not true. I'm just saying I'm listening to what you have shared with me. Little churches don't have a voice in what's going on in the SBC or at the state convention. We're too small. They don't care about us. We don't give enough. I've heard those comments. So here's something we're proposing that gives the ownership on how we do ministry, how we do missions, how we church plant. We're going to own that ourselves by creating a financial mechanism that we have our own fund to tap into when we know a church needs to be planted on whatever corner it needs to be planted on. When we know a pastor and his church are struggling financially and they need to be revitalized, we don't got to ask NAM to give us money so we can revitalize that church. We're going to go into our own checkbook. And we're going to say, we as an association are going to stand with you, brother, and we're going to help you keep the doors on. We're going to equip you, and we're going to help fund you until you get healthy again. We're going to take care of our own when they're not doing as well as some of our churches are and build that relationship. And this endowment will give us a mechanism to help us <clears throat> do that very thing. The SBA property has been used four times in the past 24 months. Four times. Two of those four was by a non-church entity. Two of the four were used by an organization that had nothing to do with the gospel or the kingdom work in the last 24 months. Now, folks, that's not good stewardship of resources, but we can make it good stewardship by repurposing some of that. Our resources at the association are dated, they're expendable, and they're no longer relevant for most churches. The library that we have there, while it was a phenomenal concept and an opportunity during its day, today here's what we want to do. Most of your grandkids have a smartphone, don't they? When they want to play something, they pull out that phone and they've got an app 
They want information about something. We all know Google is our friend, right? We go to Google and we figure out how to fix that TV remote control. Just sharing my testimony. Right? We, that's what we do. We got information at our fingertips. Now imagine if we did this for your pastors. Jared McNeil, you're a young pastor in seminary working your MDiv. How would you love to have a $100,000 library on your laptop? Would you like that? What if we as an association of churches gave our missionaries and our pastors a library that they didn't have to drive to an association building, but they could grab their laptop and on it was a $100,000 Logos library with every resource they need to be successful as a seminary student and also to bring the gospel with greater clarity and vision to their congregation. We give them the tools of Hebrew and Greek and deep study that they would have to go somewhere to some library to have, we as an association are going to provide that for some of our pastors that can't get it on their own. Maybe their churches don't have a pastor's expendable reimbursement account to be able to pay for that. Well, guess what? That's where we come alongside that pastor in that church, and we pay for his library software, and we give it to him for him to have, and he gets it forever has no strings attached to the association. That's how we're going to make ministry work to strengthen our pastors. Because here's what I believe. A strong pastor in the pulpit means a strong member in the pew. If we have strong pastors teaching theologically, theologically sound doctrine in our pulpits, which we do, we're going to continue to have our pews sound with theological doctrine on the streets sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. This endowment gives us another mechanism where people don't have to go to a library for a CD. When they get it, it's already scratched up, and it may or not work. Here we give it to them digitally, and they have that library with them. Our resource center utilizes financial revenue that could be applied directly to ministry. Electricity, water, insurance, maintenance, repair, and upkeep, all the things for a building. We are proposing that if we roll that into an endowment, then that money is going to be used and applied directly to actually doing the ministry. It will not sacrifice us meeting together as pastors. It will not sacrifice our associational events when we meet together. Last I checked, we didn't ever do an associational meeting at the SBA. We always have to use a church because most of y'all wouldn't fit in the SBA with the size of our fellowship hall, right? So we have to utilize churches to do our business anyway as an association. And folks, I believe the church is where the ministry is at. God's action arm for ministry is you and me, the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. And we as an association strengthen the bride of Christ to be about doing the gospel. The resource center requires yard maintenance, insurance requirements, facility maintenance costs, and utility expenses. These facilities across the association have all of our, all of our churches for the most part, almost every one of them, have enough space for us to do certain activities at the church. As I mentioned, this month coming up on the 27th, Brother David Helms, David, he's right there. He's going to be hosting our next pastor's lunch in. Brother Greg Newton did the last one, and so on and so forth. And we get to visit each other's ministry context. Next week, we'll meet with Brother David and with his church. They're gracious to host that. Again, we don't need to meet at the association to do pastoral strengthening and building that fellowship where our churches are stronger together. Our decision points, the sale of the SBA property will provide a financial engine to allow the SBA to meet three of its mission areas. Everything we do is up under encourage, equip, and evangelize. Under encouraging the minister, this is going to allow us to financially support and help support struggling churches of the association. Churches that may be challenged financially, we can come alongside them without having to ask Carrie for a dollar. Carrie's the Baptist State Convention in North Carolina. I love my brothers there, but folks, we're an association. Their first step and their first stop should be you and me. Their first step should be our church, our association, our bank account. Brother, what can you do to help me? I'm struggling. We have our own fund to do that. Secondly, to strengthen our churches that may need assistance with certain things financially was how we will encourage the minister. They've got a voice here in our association, and our association cares about them enough to put the money where our mouth is. We're going to come alongside you financially. We're going to help you. Our first stop for our association of churches should be the Sand Hills Baptist Association. Not NAM, not IMB, not the state convention or the SBC. The first stop should be right here with you and me. And then we work out from there because I'll take all their resources too, right? Because that's what we're going to do. My job, what you called me and Matt to do, is to leverage all we can for the gospel. And if we can bring those in to help your churches be stronger, to help our churches be stronger, so we can be what? More for the kingdom together. 
Folks, that's what we're going to do. At least that's what we're proposing uh, in terms of leveraging the resources. I'm excited about it, man. Can you all tell? Not at all, right? Under equipping the church, we have a couple things in mind. And again, this is just a preliminary list. We, we are excited to listen and, and talk with you at our town halls that are upcoming about other opportunities. Give us some new ways that we can equip the church as well. But two of the things that come to mind immediately are seminary scholarships. Right, Jared, wouldn't you love that? Would it help a little bit? It would. Any other brother struggle to still have a seminary debt or want to take more seminary classes, but you're not sure if you can afford it? We've got a couple hands out. Bill, David. Oh you, oh, you point at your brother in the back, right? Right? That's a reality. That's a concern for some of our pastors, right? Because I know you know we all get paid extremely well, right? So how can we come alongside our pastors and help them with their education pursuits? Well, this fund and this endowment would allow us to take something that's static sitting on a piece of ground, not being used for ministry, and puts it into effective ministry, and who knows who that pastor will reach next for the gospel, right? So missionary scholarships are the next one. If you want to go onto the mission field, but you don't have the funding, but you've got the heart, you know what? We're going to come alongside you, and we're going to partner with you, and we're going to help you meet the financial needs to go to the mission field. If you want to be an IMB missionary, but you're not sure how you're going to make it with your kid, your wife, and medical expenses, you know what? We're going to work with you to help get you equipped as an IMB missionary or as a missionary here locally on a short-term mission trip. You need financial help? Guess what? We've got a bank account that we can reach into at the Sand Hills Baptist Association and the buck stops here first. Our missionaries in our churches can be strengthened by our churches. What a wonderful opportunity for us to do that. And lastly, evangelizing the lost. Church strengthening is one of the number one ways to help get the gospel to the world. You ever driven by a church that was run down and ragged and there was no life in that church? You ever seen that before? I may be the only one, but isn't it discouraging? You ever want to go visit a church like that? Nah. That church is dead. I don't need nothing. They ain't got nothing for me. What if we flipped that around and every time someone drove by one of our SBA churches, they saw it and they saw life. They saw parking lots that were full. They saw lighted signs that didn't have bulbs burned out. They saw roofs that didn't need repair. When they walked in, they saw carpets that weren't torn, torn, torn and still had a smell in it that who knows what it came from. But every time they walk in, the first thing they do is they turn around and they walk back out. Because whether we like it or not, every first-time guest is a consumer. Every first-time guest is looking for the experience that they're going to have at your, your church and your congregation. How can we strengthen churches so that every time a first-time experience comes to your church, they want to come back to get more? Because instead of being distracted by all the other stuff, they get to hear the gospel preached from a theologically sound pastor. They get to be loved on by discipled brothers and sisters they get to love on and buy a church that's not worried about how much money's coming in. Because they know if they struggle and hit that point, they can reach to the Sand Hills Baptist Association and we're there to help them with some of those challenges. Church planting, we looked at Moore County in the map and I promise you we could probably double in size in the amount of churches in Moore County and still not reach the lost in Moore County. Did y'all hear that? We could double. We could be an association of 64 churches and still have a difficult time reaching the lost in Moore County. How are we going to encourage church planners to partner with us as we, in our pastoral cohorts, as we work together and identify where the next church plant should be in our association? And we begin to work with our churches to say, hey, who wants to help us plant this church? Who wants to partner with God in planting this church? Well, how do we do it? Well, we've got some engine to do that, and we'll work with NAM and do that, and we'll work with the state convention, because on your behalf, I'll take all their resources to help us meet our goals. But we have an ability now with this endowment that it will provide for us to do church planting in our own backyard where we know the need is, where your cousins, your uncles, your grandkids, your brothers, your sisters, and your neighbors, you know where they live. Tell us, and let's plant a church there as an association. We've done it once before, haven't we? Many of you remember. Anybody remember the name of that church? You can just shout it out if you want. Pinehurst First Baptist. Thank you, Tom. Did you know that was a church plant from the, from the Sand Hills Baptist Association years ago? Matt, that's right. There was a few churches that partnered together to do that. Now imagine if we, 33 churches, Chris, Imagine if we, 33 churches, partnered together in the business of church planting. 
Imagine being a strong enough pastor with his health and his church healthy enough that they can begin thinking about kingdom work outside their own congregation. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? I know I would enjoy that. Folks, we can take that responsibility and we own that as an association together. That's the things that we will do and can do. And lastly, mission scholarships, providing that financial mechanism. These are some of the opportunities that we have discussed being able to do. Again, we'd like to share with you a little bit of the financials uh, of what that's going to take to establish an account to provide an income. And right now, without giving you all the detail, details on the sale, we would love to do that at the town hall meeting because it's a lot of information we would like to share with you. But what we can do is give you an idea of a, the amount of income, the revenue, and in perpetuity. We have an ability based on the work that Robert Simons has done for us. He has showed us that in 25 years, we will still have more money in that account and more money given to the mission field than we currently have in our property and our assets. Over the next 25 years with this endowment, we have the ability to invest $1.2 million into our churches in the Sand Hills Baptist Association and still have half that resource available to continue doing ministry work with. So it's a, it's a wonderful plan, and I'd love to share all the details with you tonight because we're pretty excited about the opportunities. But again, it's a recommendation that we need to discuss further, much further. So here's what we also propose to you. We would like to meet to discuss this opportunity and to hear your feedback and solicit it in the way of a town hall meeting to where you come prepared with questions, with ideas, with understandings. And by the way, it's on the back of your bulletin. If you've got a bulletin when you turned up here, on the very back page of that bulletin, by the Sand Hills Baptist Association logo at the top of that page are the three dates that we are proposing for the town hall meeting. And at this town hall meeting, what we would love to do is to hear your input, hear your concerns, hear the challenges, and, and I think there may be some information that you can provide that we haven't thought about yet. Um, what about this and what about that? We would love to get that at the town hall meeting so that we can facilitate greater understanding of the recommendations that we're making before you uh, and that you have input in that and we get to address concerns, cares, and also maybe new opportunities that we haven't thought about. So the town hall meetings will be May 3rd at 7 p.m. May 3rd at 7 p.m. That first one will be held at Eagle Springs Baptist Church. Eagle Springs Baptist Church. You good with that one, Matt? Okay. And uh, is there anyone from the association that would like to host the second one? June 7th, 7 p.m. If not, we'll get you that date at the town hall meeting on May 3rd. We will provide the next location for the town hall meeting, but it will be on June 7th, location to be determined. We're going to try to separate them throughout the association. That way we have equal distance and people can drive to them. Uh, and it's fairly convenient for all of us, for most of them. Uh, it's never convenient for everybody, all right? But uh, that's the best that we're going to try to do. And lastly, the special called business meeting for a vote, July 12th. And here's the urgency. I know there's a lot of concern in, in church life, right? They say the only person that likes change is a baby. Well, the reality of it here is what we have, okay? In prayer and concernment long before, and Crystal Allard, you can give testimony if I'm, if I'm lying here. May God strike me dead, but you know otherwise. Uh, she was privy to these conversations long before I became your AMS. Uh, but we were discussing how do we reshape the association, and the building came up. This executive committee, when we first came together, that was one of the topics of discussion. Within a week of being your AMS for this provisional revitalization period, within a week, Ms. Jane Cowan gave me a phone call. And she says, Pastor, someone would like to talk to you about buying our building. We hadn't put it on the market. We hadn't talked to nobody about any ideas. It hadn't been shared with anybody. Now, how often do we say, Lord, if you really want me to move to take that church, you'll, buy, you'll send someone to buy my house tomorrow, and I won't even put it on the market. Right? I mean, we, haven't we done, who's done that? Chris, thank you. You're the only truth one in here, right? Right? <laughs> I've done it. Lord, if you want me to go to that other church, then somebody will want to buy my house. Well, they didn't because he wanted me here. Amen? We did this, and guess what? Hey, uh, can I talk to you about potentially buying your building? No kidding. God is my witness. We didn't advertise it. We weren't looking for it. A buyer came to us. Now, we pray about a lot of things, and sometimes the answer scares us because we don't know what to do with it. 
So here's what we have right now, and it's all provisional and content or contingent upon our association making this decision that this is the right move for the association. We have a buyer that's already signed a sales contract guaranteeing the purchase of that property with the understanding that it is provisional upon the association's approval of its sale. Now he would like that to be done as soon as possible. But again, I said, oh, you're dealing with a Baptist church entity. Come on now, we don't do things quick. Especially not something like this. this. This takes a lot of prayer, brother. Right? He said, okay, I'm willing to wait because I'm a believer as well. And I want to see kingdom resources. Matter of fact, I'm going to use it. And I'm going to continue ministering to this community with that property. And he shared with me what he was going to do. And he gave us an offer. And I brought that offer to the executive council. And the executive council all scratched her head and said, but can't you get a little more? Right? And I said, yes, I can. Right? So we went back and we met again. And working with Brother Robert Simons, we had a target idea of what we wanted to establish this endowment fund, a little over $500,000, to get this endowment started. Now, mind you, in 1996, the SBA Sandhills Tax Value Property Assessment was $176,000. Brother Billy Graham and Miss Ann was gracious last week and hosted us at their home for a wonderful lunch, one of the best lunches I've ever had. Thank you again for that. It was good. And we sat at that lunch and he shared with me that it took just over $100,000 in sweat and effort from the association to build that building debt free. Now, can you imagine how God's going to take $100,000 and the love of Jesus Christ and the effort that this association had to build that and then repurpose that into a $500,000 endowment that's going to be worth $1.2 million after the next 25 years and be doing ministry every year for the next 25 years with that endowment. What a wonderful opportunity, a vision for the future of what we could do with something that is sitting empty right now, not being utilized. Not because it can't be, but because it doesn't need to be. Doesn't need to be. And we'll share that with you at the town hall meetings. So those are the dates, those are the facts and the recommendations that the association uh, executive council has, has brought before you today. We hope that that has sparked some interest with you we hope that you will join us on May 3rd uh, for our first town hall meeting to discuss the specifics. In that, we will lay out the financials. We will lay out the endowment fund establishment. We'll look at how much money each year. Uh, we know what those figures are. We'll look at the date for sale, what we will do with that money. But here's what I know. If we choose not to sell and say we don't want to sell it at all, it will continue to take money from a dwindling account of churches not contributing financially. And it will also cost us money to operate that facility over the next year, two to three years to upkeep it and maintain it. We know that. That's with anything, even our homes. It costs us money. The question we've got to struggle with, is that money worth the kingdom investment in a building? Or would it be better used in a body who gets to know Jesus Christ through our efforts? So that's what I'll leave you with. Now here's what we're going to do, and this is, this is uh, against his best judgment. We're going to open up the floor, I guess, or no, you're going to. I'm going to sit down and shut up. All right. God bless you, and thank you. Thank you, Virgil and, and Mr. Uh, Simmons, uh, for your presentations. Thank the um, uh, executive council for the many hours that we have been through this with these two fellows, and uh, thank you so much. And as, as uh, was mentioned, you've seen the recommendations. Uh, you've heard the action plan. And the fact that we want to chew on this, sit on it, think on it, and come back for discussions on May the 3rd for our first meeting. But we will take just a few minutes. If you have a burning comment, statement, or some feelings that you would like to share, we will open the floor uh, for just a, you know, a minute or so each person. And we would ask you to please uh, come to the microphone. Yes, sir. I'm Mike Branscombe from First Baptist Church, Aberdeen. Uh, if I had been here in 1990 when that building was built, I'm sure I would have been in support of it. I would have worked towards it. I would have led my church to give towards it and all of that. And it was the right thing to do in 1990. I believe today the right thing to do is what we're being recommended by our executive council. And because associational work has changed, and is changing and it's going to change even more 
And I believe the right thing to do is what Virgil and Matt and the Executive Council has laid out for us to do. And I thank them for their work and, uh, and appreciate them, and I'll try to be at one of those meetings to hear more about this. Thank you, Brother Mike. Nate, yes, sir. And please state your church and your name. Yes. I'm David Burroughs, pastor at Ashley Heights. <clears throat> Buildings are temporary. Uh, they're tools. And certainly people who work with tools know that tools need to be upgraded and updated. And I don't dispute that at all. My concern is the association is not us, it's those people in the 32 churches. And we've got about half the churches that are not participating right now. I would say revitalization of the association has to do with getting into those churches and making the association present to them. That's kind of what our BOMs have done in the past. Uh, Tom had a regular schedule to be in the churches, and he might not have known everybody's name, but everybody knew him. And the same thing with Dr. J. Billy. And ministries about relationships, and certainly, you know, our. You, you got a bottom line of uh, to meet the overhead costs of operating. I understand that. If and when we do anything with the property, the people in the churches, uh, they're the association, they're the ones that paid the money and gave the sweat and all that, it's particularly the ones in the older generation who are still with us. And this is gonna have to be handled with great finesse. It's gonna have to be handled slowly and patiently. A church moves slow. An association generally moves a little bit slower because we don't meet every Sunday. And uh, this, is, this is gonna take a lot of prayer and a lot of patience and also God quit making land a while back and the value of that property is not going down uh, and it's probably going to go up uh, I am leery of anything that is put out there and said well we got to decide on this in three months three uh, I'm thinking more like three years to be realistic to get everybody on board. Moving a flock is what a shepherd does. I can't move the flock God's entrusted to me at the speed the fastest ones can run. I gotta move it at the speed the slowest ones can crawl and some of them don't wanna move at all. Uh, but we gotta strike a happy medium. We don't wanna lose what we got in the process. I'm just urging, let's be cautious. I wanna be a team player. I wanna support and be part of serving the Lord and, and whatever that looks like. And a lot of things don't look the way like they used to look. But we are also in a time when historical Buildings and things are being destroyed and done away with and Abraham Lincoln's name and Washington, all those taken down by people who don't know and appreciate the history. And we don't want anything in our association to smack of that. So we want to be very, very careful. That's all I want to say. And by the way, when we tie the knot with y'all a year from now, I don't want it to be a slip knot or a half hitch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. Brother David. Hi, I'm David Helms from First Baptist Southern Pines. And uh, certainly we need to think about the future. 
and I appreciate the work that Matt and Virgil have done in pulling this together. However, I do agree with David Burroughs that this is something we need to think through deeply with the association. Uh, I wasn't aware of what was going on until I heard something about it this past week. So I think our churches need to be better informed. I think all of us need the information. Unrelated to this particular proposal, for instance, I was talking to someone about real estate in our area, and they told me, if you thought last year your home could sell for this amount of money, you ought to add $100,000 to it. Property values in this area are going way up. And so I think we need to think about that before we sign the dotted line uh, for a proposal that was made uh, months ago. Uh, the other part of it is I think it's a balancing act. I've been here long enough, 38 years, to remember the people in our churches who did give sacrificially to that effort. Uh, the people who not only gave financially, but helped with the work of laying the brick and building the building. And I think perhaps one of the things that I haven't heard tonight is how do we reimagine how that building might be used for future work in the church, uh, in the association? Because it is true. I know in Southern Pines, there is no land available. And we may be sitting on a great treasure that we may need to think twice about before we sell it. And all I'm, all I'm trying to say here is, let's take our time. Let's prayerfully think through this. And let's make sure our churches are well informed and are behind it. Uh, one of the first things that Virgil said, and I, I think it's a great point, we need to learn how to communicate better in our churches and our association uh, so that we understand and that we're united in moving forward. Uh, and therefore, I do uh, ask us to give ample time and not rush this decision uh, because I think there'll be plenty of buyers uh, if that were to be the best way forward. Now, I, I want to say, I'm, you know, I've been here, I'm the ancient of days here in this association, uh, but at the same time, I recognize change is coming. Uh, we, ter we teach about uh, multiple virtual classes every week. I teach at Campbell a virtual class every week. I understand these dimensions. I understand how the world is changing. Yet at the same time, I want us to do, do this in a way that we're united, we're together, we're informed, uh, and we all feel good about it. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's take maybe one more if we, we, we've been here over an hour and a half and if, if someone else has a burn, burning comment. Uh, okay. I'm David Reynolds, pastor of Middle Cross Church. First of all, I want to say that I'm not opposed to us selling the building, if that's what we choose to do as an association. Um, however, I do feel like that in this time of interim, these men are serving as interim uh, missionary directors, and we appreciate what they're doing, and I appreciate the vision. Um, I feel like uh, exactly what both of these men have, have said, that we need to slow down. What if, and I'm just making this a what if, what if our next associational missionary says we need an office for me to work out of? Now, I know that we have 33 churches now, uh, and it's possible that we could do that, but I feel like, and this is me, and I'm one person that has one opinion, that we need to, we need to slow down um, we need to make sure that we work through this time of transition from uh, uh, Brother Tom to a new missionary director. And whoever that is, I just feel like we need to slow down, uh, not rush through this thing, as these men have said, and let's work through this and make sure it's the right decision for the association. Okay. Thank you very much. I would... Uh ask uh, Sister Tammy Lytle 
to work their way up, a dedicated Christian committed to serving as their, on our executive council. And um, uh, Brother uh, Virgil, if there's no further business that you work your way up, uh, I'll go ahead and, and ask for a motion to close uh, close our business meeting at this time. I Got a, a motion over here, a second? second? All in favor say aye. aye. Okay. Uh, Sister Tammy is going to close us in prayer, and then we have uh, re refreshments provided uh, back in the social hall, which is down the hall to the left, I believe. Okay. Is that right? You can run out these doors, or you can go around. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to come together tonight to worship you, to praise you, and to um, see the vision that you have for us, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you will lead us through your Holy Spirit in what you would have us to do, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we'll each search our hearts and take ourselves out of the equation and see what you would have us to do to further your kingdom. And we just pray, Lord, that you would just lead us and guide us and Help us to have peace in our hearts about what you are showing each one of us as individuals and as your church, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for what you are doing through the council, through the members of each church, Lord, and through um, the leaders here tonight, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that you would just um, show us, Lord, the right thing to do, Lord. We know, Lord, that everyone has concerns one way or another, and we all have an opinion, but... Help it not to be an opinion. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge and give us the understanding that we need. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.